So I won't be spending that much of time on slides. Uh, mostly I'll be doing hands-on. And uh, also, please feel free to ask any questions at any, any point. So me and Dimutu will be doing the tutorial. Okay. So those who are new to uh, identity server, so who, who are in the IAM track yesterday? Okay, so there are a few who are not there. So identity server is uh, an identity access management product. It's open source like uh, any other uh, WSL products. And <coughs> we mainly focus on web single sign-on and identity federation, and then again, identity broker. And we build the rest of the functionality around that to make uh, the, the single sign-on and federation case much stronger. Right? So we do support uh, SAML 2.0, uh, web single sign-on, OpenID Connect, uh, WS Federation, CANS, uh, all popular standards uh, uh, we do support. And then again, with, we, we have very powerful use cases with uh, identity broker functionality. You can uh, 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 transform and mediate token between different uh, uh, protocol types. Like you can get a SAML request, and then identity server will create an open ID connect request and get the response back, and then we'll in return send back, an, back a SAML response. So we can see all those stuff as we go on. And then again, we have account management and identity provisioning. You can deploy identity server or an existing user store. It can be a database, uh, an active directory, LDAP. And also, uh, uh, at that, uh, uh, you can also plug identity server to any custom user store too. We have an extension point there. So you can just extend the user store manager and write an, uh, uh, your own custom code to talk to your own custom user store. Then again, for fine grained access control, uh, uh, we rely on SACML. So SACML is a de facto standard for fine grained access control. We can talk uh, uh, more about this stuff. And for API security, we support like all the core standards. We support all the uh, uh, four core grant types in O2 uh, main RFC. And then again, we support SAML grant type, JWT grant type, uh, introspection specification, dynamic client registration, those stuff. So just summarizing stuff, I'll be going through all this stuff. Uh, in the hands-on session, right? Okay. So let me uh, start. Uh, so you just need to go to wso.com and uh, go to the identity server product page, and you need to download it. It's around 300 MB right now, uh, and unzip it. Only uh, environment requirement you need to have is you need to have Java. So we recommend to use JDK 1.8 plus. Set the Java home. It's a zip file. Unzip it. Then you can just spin up and run it. Right? Very basic uh, 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 system specification we need. So I have already started that in the server. So here it is running. Right? So let me log in. Uh, by default, it comes with an inbuilt user store that is running on Apache DS in LDAP. But in a production environment, we don't recommend use that. Basically, you will need to connect it to your own existing user store, which can be another LDAP or an Active Directory, or you may have your own database, right? So once the server is up, you can log into Identity Service Management Console. The default credentials are admin, admin, right? So I'll, I'll show you where to configure this stuff too. So I'm now logged in. Uh, so admin user comes from an LDAP, that's the embedded LDAP. So those details are configured in this particular file. If you go to identity server home page, home directory, repository, conf, user management. So if you open up this file, so this is where we define the primary user store, right? So here you can see uh, the connection URL to LDAP and the connection password, those stuff. And uh, all the credentials in this file in a production environment, we recommend to encrypt it. So we have a tool called Secure Vault. Once you run it, uh, all the credentials here will get encrypted, right? So if you have any doubts or questions, uh, any time, please raise your hand and ask. So now this, this particular instance, I have configured against the embedded LDAP. And also, uh, we do support multiple user stores, right? So you can add any number of user stores to identity server. In this particular instance, it's running on the primary LDAP and also secondary database. In database is a MySQL uh, instance, right? To add a secondary user store, 
the primary user store you can only add from the file system, right? Under repository conf user management XML. But any second user stores you can add from the management console. So if you want to add here, you can go here, add, and then you need to pick the connector you want to connect to a user store based on the user store type. So in, in, in some scenarios, when you deploy identity server in a production setup, you may already have a central place to manage users. You may have an active directory to manage users, right? So in that case, they will not let us connect to the AD in a read-write mode, right? They won't give us permission. So in that case, you can pick the read-only LDAP user store manager. If you, if you want to connect to LDAP or Active Directory or read-write, then you can pick the read-write user store manager. If it's a database, then you can pick the JDBC base user store manager. I have already one configured, so let me show you this one. So this is a JDBC user store manager, which is connecting to a MySQL instance running in my local machine. And when you mount a secondary user store to the identity server, you need to give a domain name, right? So this is that domain name. Yeah. Sorry? Font? OK. Good? OK. So this is, uh, this is that domain name, right? So now two user stores are mounted on this particular identity server instance. Now if you go to users here, user roles and list, if you click on users, you can see users from all the user stores, right? So here I have mounted this MySQL user store under the domain name foo. So all the users coming from that particular user store, they are qualified with the domain name foo, right? So if you want to uh, uh, just pick the users from the foo user store, you can find them. And the primary user store doesn't have a domain, right? So if user doesn't have a domain, then it's a user belongs to the primary user store, right? So you can, you can perform any account management functionalities from here, like if you want to add users, you can add new user, select the domain to which user store you want to add, right? Then give the username and add this particular user. So multiple user stores, uh, uh, it, it has a very, very valid requirement. So mostly like if you have multiple departments, and each department may have their own user store, right? And the same user could be in all the user stores in all those departments with different, different names. Now, when you want to build a unified IND platform across the company, what you can do is you can mount all those user stores you already have to the identity server instance, right? Then you can give an option to the user to link your accounts. We have that support too. I'll show you that. Once you have already, once you, you user can log into identity server with one username and password, then he can pick the connected accounts and link them all together, right? So that's one step, and then most of the first step when you go in a migration path to build a unified identity platform, right? Any questions up to now? Okay. So then we also have roles, right? And we support external roles and also internal roles, right? So I mentioned that we can, we can deploy identity server multiple user stores, right? So we can retrieve users and also roles from that user store and display those stuff in the identity server, right? You can add a user for a particular role like that. You can do user role assignments too. So if you are using Active Directory groups, they will map to roles here, right? <coughs> you can specify in the, in the LDAP configuration, group search base, user search base, those stuff. So those are the external roles. You cannot assign a user from foo user store to a group in bar user store or a role in bar user store, right? But if you have a requirement where you want to have a role with users across user stores, right? Then what you can do is you can create an internal role, right? So that should be an yeah, internal role. Pick the domain name. So this should be an internal role. So this role will get created in the identity server itself, right? 
it doesn't get created in your connected LDAP Active Directory or your own user store. That will get created in that database underneath the identity server. And for internal roles, you can assign users from different different user stores. Right? Any questions? OK. So now we have users. Uh, uh, we have mounted the user stores. And we have users from those users, user stores. So now how do we retrieve user attributes? Right? So if you, if you connect identity server to an LDAP, right? in LDAP has a field called mail to represent the user's email address. Right? It has other fields like SN, CN, likewise. Right? And if you have a, a, a database, so database has different column names. Right? So maybe email underscore address. First underscore name for first name, right? Last underscore name for last name. So different user stores, they have their own way to store attributes. So they have their own metadata. If we rely, if the top level applications that we build rely on the schema of the database, that's not going to work, right? You, we then create a tight coupling between our top level applications like web apps with the the attribute names or the metadata at the user store level. To avoid that, we have something called claim mapping. Right? So this has a set of dialects. So dialects would represent the application. Right? So in WSO2 uh, identity server, this is a dialect we use. Right? So if you go here, if you want to see what's in email address, Right. If you click on this one, so this is the URI, right? This is the URI the application will refer to, right? This is independent from the attribute IDs from the underneath user store, and this can be mapped to the attribute IDs, right? So here it says the top level application will ask a given user's email address by passing this URI, then. It'll, the, the identity server will find the mapping using this, the claim configuration. You see, the primary user store is mapped, primary user is LDAP, it is mapped to this particular attribute ID. Right? If you have multiple user stores, for each user store domain name, you can, uh, you can uh, put the, the mapped attribute. Right? If you don't put anything here, then we assume the attribute IDs of all the other user stores is also as same as what's in the primary. So you will understand more the, how the claim mapping works as we go on. Any questions? Uh, OK. So let me show you a quick demo. Right? So now identity server is deployed over two user stores, right? LDAP and MySQL. Now let's see how we can connect to Salesforce. Right? So you want your users to log into Salesforce from your corporate LDAP, right? So you have your users in corporate LDAP, you want them to log into Salesforce. So first you need to do is, you need to add identity server as a trusted IDP to the Salesforce. So Salesforce is using SAML, right? Are you all familiar with SAML? OK. SAML is a uh, standard which defines, so SAML has multiple things, right? Uh, it, 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 it has a request response protocol. You have SAML request, SAML response. And then again, uh, it defines set of bindings, like how to transport. A binding says how to transport a SAML request from one place to another place. Right? So you can transport like uh, user attributes, uh, authentication assertions, authorization assertions in a SAML message from an identity provider to the service provider. So Salesforce is a service provider. Identity server is the IDP. Now you want to log into Salesforce with the identity server. right? To log into Salesforce with the identity server, identity server must provide a SAML assertion, which is signed from the identity server. right? So now, for, to the Salesforce to trust that, you need to add identity server there as a trusted IDP. right? So now I need to log into Salesforce first.
So once you log into Salesforce, so this is a developer account. You need to go to identity, single sign-on settings, and then you can create an IDP here using a metadata file. Right? So you can download that metadata file from here. So this is a feature we added uh, since Identity Server 530. Go to Identity Providers, Resident Identity Provider, Inbound Authentication Configuration, SAML. So this is SAML metadata. Right? Click on this one. It will download the SAML metadata file. Then you go here, new from metadata file, choose file, pick that file, create. This will create an identity server instance. So I just put a different name. So this has everything, right? This has identity server's public certificate, which the Salesforce will use to verify the signature of the SAML response, and the login URL, right? Whenever your question? Okay. So uh, when, you, when you go to Salesforce, Salesforce will redirect you to this particular URL. Right? This is called SP initiated SSO. So you, you first go to the service provider, then you initiate login from there, then you will get redirect to the IDP. So this is all you need to do. You need to remember this uh, name, the entity ID. Right? Actually, you don't need to remember that even. You just save it. Right? Invalid data. So, does the uh, entity ID of the SAML affiliation get set on the service provider level inside of WSO2, or is it on the IDP level? Yeah, you need to... Do you, have, you have different entity IDs for your different service providers. Yeah. So you can, you can download this metadata file, right? Then, then you create the service provider in IS using the metadata file, right? Then each service provider will have its own unique entity ID. Right? I, the, we cannot create this here because this has already one here, right? So anyway, if you just create it, it will create the uh, service provider here. You can find here because I couldn't create it in Salesforce because you already have an entity ID here with the same service provider ID, right? It should be unique across the application, right? So now I have this service provider created in Salesforce. I can just download the metadata file, right? So I downloaded the metadata file from Salesforce. And you can go here. And now you can go to the, we need to create a service provider, right? So we added identity server as a trusted IDP to Salesforce using the identity server's IDP metadata XML file. So now we need to create a trusted service provider in the identity server side with the metadata XML from the Salesforce, right? So still we are building the, the bootstrap trust relationship. So you can go here, add service provider, let's say Salesforce 2, register. Now, so this is an important page. So here, the, the first element we need to have a look is inbound authentication configuration. right? So inbound authentication configuration means this is from the identity server's point of view, right? So identity server gets an inbound authentication request, right? So you go to Salesforce. Salesforce will generate a request. And authentication request, it will come to identity server, right? So from identity server side, it's an inbound authentication request. Now we support multiple inbound authentication request types, right? It can be SAML, OpenID Connect, WS Federation, CAS, or even your custom configuration. Right? In this case, it's SAML. Right? So Salesforce is generating a SAML request and sending it to the identity server. So the beauty of the identity server is, so none of these elements here you see, they are hard-coded to the product. Right? So this is one of our key extension points. So if you have your custom authentication protocol, then only thing you need to do is you need to write a write a custom inbound authenticator. You need to write in Java and drop that to the identity server. Then that will pick identity server will pick it here and display. Then you just need to configure it, right? In an inbound authenticator, there are two parts. One is the request parser, 
right? So whenever you get a SAML request from Salesforce, it will hit the request parcel of the inbound authenticator. So it will validate the request. Once you validate the request, then it will hand the control to the identity server. Then once everything is done, it will send the identity server will hand over the response back to the inbound authenticator's response builder. The response builder will build the SAML response and send it to the CLS. So that is how it works, right? So you can write your own request parser and response builder to accommodate your custom protocol. So in this particular case, Salesforce is supporting SAML, so I need to uh, click on that, go to configure, and now I'll pick metadata file configuration. I need to choose that file, so this is that, open it, upload, done. So now that's it, right? So it doesn't take that much of time. You just go to Salesforce, download the identity server's IDP metadata XML, create the trusted IDP, download the service provider metadata XML, come to IS, and create the uh, trusted service provider here. Right? So I have already done that, so I'll use uh, the one that I have created. Right? So now we have done the bootstrap. So with this, I should be able to log into Salesforce. Right? So that's all. If you just copy this URL, right. just copy that URL here. It, you first go to uh, Salesforce. Salesforce will find out you don't have an authenticated session. Then Salesforce will redirect you to the identity server, right? Using SAML. So I can log in here. The identity server will generate a SAML response and send it to Salesforce, and now you are logged in, right? And, and if you want to test this stuff, you will find out what exactly happening. There's a nice plugin uh, called SSO Tracer, right? Firefox plugin, you can just enable it. Now what will happen if I do it again? So this is running on the browser, so even though you use TLS, you can see everything while it's on the browser. Right, so if you go here again, login, so I'm logged in again. Now if you look at the look at the tracer here, right, uh, you can see all the requests. If you want to see the SAML request from Salesforce, this is the one. Right? If you want a SAML response, this is the one. So this helps you to debug, like see whether the right name goes from your IDP to Salesforce or you send the right uh, attributes, those stuff. Yeah. So any questions? Uh, OK, so this is a very the basic demo. Then let's see how to send attributes to Salesforce. OK, so if you want to send attributes to Salesforce, under the claim configuration here, under, under service providers list, claim configuration, you need to pick which attributes you want to send. Right? Here you can see I am sending country and given name. Right? So this is what I talked before. So this, none of these fields refer to attribute IDs. They just refer to attribute IDs through a claim URI. Right? So your user store may change at any time, but you don't need to change any of these application level configurations, right? So here it asks, send country and give a name in the response to, to the uh, uh, Salesforce service provider, okay? So in fact, if you look at this message, you should see the SAML, in, in the SAML response which goes from identity server to the uh, Salesforce, those attributes should be there, right? Now let's say how to enable Facebook login to Salesforce, right? So Salesforce uses SAML between identity server and Salesforce. So how do you log into Salesforce with Facebook without doing any configuration changes at the service Salesforce side? So you can think about Salesforce as any other service provider, right? It can be a web app, it can be a mobile app, any service provider, right? Just an example, I'm picking uh, Salesforce here. To enable Facebook login to, uh, to Salesforce, first we need to represent Facebook 
as a trusted IDP in the identity server. Right? To do that, you need to go here, identity providers, add, and give all the names. I have one configured, I'll show you that. Right? Give the name, and we have a set of authenticators here. Right? So here we need to use Facebook configuration. Right? So I need to put, I need to create a Facebook app in Facebook, and that will give me the client ID and the client secret. So Facebook uses O2O. Right, and I need to pick the client ID here, put the client secret here, and put the information I need from Facebook. Right, so that's it. So this is my Facebook configuration update done. Then you need to engage this IDP to the login flow or the authentication flow of the Salesforce or the service provider. Right, to do that. I need to go to service providers, edit this. Now, so this is about inbound authentication configuration, right? It's about how you pass the authentication request coming from a sales service provider and how you build a response to a service provider. Now, this is local and outbound authentication configuration, right? So once you get the authentication request from the service provider, you can authenticate the user in the way you want, right? None of these federation specifications, they talk about how to authenticate the user. It's up to the IDP, right? In the request itself, you can build certain recommendations, but it's IDP who decides how to authenticate the user. User can be authenticated locally with user's username and password, which will identity server will talk to LDAP or any other uh, user store behind, or else we can federate user to another IDP, right? So in this case, Facebook is another IDP, right? So Salesforce send a request to identity server, then identity server can send a request to sales Facebook. So user authenticates with Facebook, comes back, then identity server will generate some response and send it to Salesforce, right? So now we have a representation for Facebook. Only thing we need to do here is enable federated authentication and just pick Facebook as the IDP. That's it. Done. Now, if we try to log in here, you will not even notice the identity server page in the middle. Right? So it went through the identity server, identity server but you, you won't even notice it, right? So let me log in with my Facebook account. So this will generate an OAuth response and send it to identity server. Identity server will do the OAuth handshake, get the user's information, and build a similar response and send it to Salesforce. And now you are logged into Salesforce. Right? So you didn't have to touch Salesforce with a configuration change in identity server. You can do it. Right? So Facebook is an, just a one example. You can have multiple IDPs. Right? The best example is you may have multiple partners, right? And you have a set of web applications, and you want the, the users or the employees from those partners to access these applications. So once they click on the link on that for that particular application, you will read it to the IDP. Then IDP will show a set of trusted IDP list. Right? Then you click on that IDP. Identity server will take that user to its own home IDP. You authenticate there get the response, and identity server will validate that, build its own response, and send it to the, the service provider. So the benefit here is all your service providers or all your applications will only trust your own IDP. They need not to worry about any of the external IDPs. Right? Another, another use case is you may have user stores, multiple user stores, one for the employees and another one for the customers. Right? And there can be applications in your company where you want both the customers and employees to log in. Right? So at WSO2, uh, we use Jira as, you, as our defect tracking system. So our customers will log in there too, and employees will log in too. Right? 
But as a practice, you need to decouple the customer, customer uh, uh, identity data and employee identity data. So what you can do is you can have one IDP for your customers, another IDP for your employees, right? And your applications, they will only trust your customer IDP, right? So whenever a user goes to the application, that application will blindly redirect the user to the customer IDP. So if it's a customer, he can just log into that IDP and that will generate some response and send to the application. But if it's an employee, then you can click on a link which will take you to the other IDP or else you can do some shortcuts. You just can type your username there or your email address. Then, I, then the IDP can find who your IDP just by looking at your email address and then you will get redirected to the your employee IDP. So we have done a similar setup for many customers. One is Verifone. Uh, anyone of you know about Verifone? Yeah. So I'm not sure it's popular in Europe, but uh, in, in, in Asia and even US, it's very popular. Like when you swipe your credit card, see whether the, the brand of that machine. So most of the time, it's from Verifone. Right? So they use one IDP, which is the ADFS. Then they use identity server to manage their customers. right? So identity server adds the, the ADFS as a trusted IDP to it. Yes, any questions? Are we clear or are we not clear about anything? <laughs> yeah. yeah? So there are no questions, means either you are clear, 100% clear, or you are not 100% clear, not clear about anything. I assume you are 100% clear, right? Is that right? Yes, you have a question. How does the permissions get mapped when you log into like, Salesforce? So you, you may have a set of. Okay, yeah, I think it's a very, very good question, yeah. So, so there are multiple ways. Uh, so it's about authorization, right? So identity server, so far what we have seen is it only does the authentication part, right? So sa Salesforce generates request, it comes to identity server. Identity server authenticates a user and sends a summary response to Salesforce. That will only tell Salesforce, this is a good enough user to log in. This is a user from my IDP. That's all it will say. It won't tell Salesforce what this particular user can do on Salesforce. Right? Salesforce has its own set of permissions. Right? So what we need to do is, so that is where the provisioning comes in. Right? First, you need to provision this particular user to Salesforce with the permissions. When you provision, you don't need to provision all the user attributes. You only need to pick a mapping attribute. What attribute I need to provision? You provision that attribute to Salesforce and assign permissions in Salesforce for that particular identifier. And in the summer response, you carry that identifier. Right? So now Salesforce knows, looking at the summer response, this is a good enough user from one of my trusted IDPs. Now it will try to look at its database and try to find out what are things this user can do. Right? So let me show an example. Right? So in this particular case, if you go to uh, uh, users, you can find Users in sales. So these are the provision users, right? So you have different identifiers. So these are the identifiers you should carry from IDP to Salesforce, and this defines the roles that you can play on Salesforce, right? So let me create a user here, right? Let's say Nuan. Okay. Nuance user profile, and let's say Nuance, Nuance at wsu.com. OK. So now Nuance is a valid user in identity server, right, IDP. But I didn't provision this user to Salesforce. Right? Even though Peter could log into Salesforce, Nuance should not be able to log into Salesforce, right? Because the login will pass, but authorization will fail. Now, if we go back to Salesforce, I'll remove the Facebook thing. Just local, basic code. 
Okay, so now if you go to Salesforce here, now I tried login with Nua. It should fail. It's an error, right? So if you go to Salesforce log and if you look at that little cell, you cannot find this particular user in Salesforce in, under its authorization database, right? Okay. So now let's see. So okay, since we discussed about authorization, right? Yeah. Can you hear mic? Uh, we don't have. Can you hear mic there? Thanks. Hello. Um, so that's fine if you want to provision all of your users in mm -hmm. your end system, but you may just want categories. So alumni, students, staff. So I want my IDP to tell the SP what type of person this is, and then the authorization, so what they're allowed to see at the SP's end, at the service end, will just be based on the type, not based on who they are, and having pre-provisioned a set of roles, but just based on the IDP saying, this person is of type student, or of type student and staff. So the roles that are set for it, or some metadata that's set for it in the um, centrally, Mm -hmm. can be used to do the authorization. Yes, that's true. So that's another model, right? So both Google Labs and Salesforce use the model I just explained. You need to provision the users to Google Labs and Salesforce with the roles that they will get from that particular service provider. It won't decide what user can do in Salesforce or Google Labs by looking at the attributes coming in the similar response. But then again, there's another model. I think that's what you were trying to explain. That mo model is, rather than provisioning each and every user to service provider, why not you carry the user's roles in the summer response itself? Right? <coughs> then you don't need to provision each user. The ser service provider will just look at the role, and based on that, it will decide what this particular person can do on that particular service provider. Right? Amazon follows that model. Right? So I'll show you how, to, how that works. So we, I have an Amazon IDP service provider here too. Right? So here you can see Amazon is, once again, it uses OpenID Connect and also SAML. So here I have configured uh, in the same way I did before, right? Uh, SAML service provider for Amazon. And here, under claim configuration, I am sending these two specific claims. Here you can see these claims are not identity server claims, right? This, these claims, they don't belong to the identity server WC2 org dialect, right? So these are, these are specific to Amazon, right? So I have de defined a custom dialect, and you can see this custom dialect is mapped to local dialect. Right? So that means this particular URI, this is internal to identity server, this has a mapping attribute in the user store. But we don't include that URI in the response that we generate. We include the URI specific to service provider. This is called a claim mapping. Right? So Amazon need to have this role and role session attribute in the similar response. Role session is basically the name. Role is the role that this particular user can play on Amazon. Right? Let's see how this works. And Amazon is using IDP initiator, not SP initiator. Right? So that means the initial request will come to the IDP, then you will get redirected to the service provider. So once you type this one, it's an identity server. So I log in with Peter, and this will create a summer response and takes me to the AWS. So now I'm logging there, so, but I don't need to provision each and every user there. So even no one can log in there if no one has those particular attributes in its user store against its profile. Right? <laughs> That's one model. And there's another way. So we have introduced another layer of authorization at the IDP side. Yes, you can authorize the users at the service provider in two, 
but you can also provide additional authorization layer in the identity server due to the login flow itself. You can tell, like, uh, uh, users uh, can log into Salesforce only between 4 a.m. and 4 p.m. We will not issue a token outside that time. You can also tell only the people in the sales team role can log into Salesforce like that. Right? So let's see how we can do a time-based policy here. To do that, you need to go to policy view, policy administration. Then we have a set of template policies, right? You can pick the, the template you need. Uh, so here I have a time-based one for Salesforce, right? So in this policy, you only need to change this one. You need to change this name. This should match your service provider, right? So I have put here Salesforce. And then you just need to change the values. So this says from 3 to 8, you are permitted. Uh, now it's 4, so this should be permitted. Let's change it to 6. Right? You can only log in to Salesforce between 6 and 8. Right? So I save that policy. And so this is the policy administration point. So if you are familiar with SACML, you know. So this is a policy administration point. So I will deploy this policy to the policy decision point. Right? Publish it. And pick, we can publish to multiple PDPs, but here I am picking the local one, publish. Now, if you go to policy view here, you should see that policy. Okay. Only six to eight. Now, if you try to access this, it should fail, right? So I can log in as Peter. Pass. Why? I didn't do one configuration. You deploy the policy, but at the service provider level, you should enable authorization. Under local and outbound authentication configuration, enable authorization. Right? Otherwise, it won't read the policy. Now it says authorization failed, right? All these UIs can be rethemed, right? Now let's change the policy and see. Let's change this to 15. That is 3 to 8. Sorry? Uh, so, we, we modified the start date, the start hour of the operation. Yeah, yeah. But let's, let's... Uh... Yes, let's pretend now that we are during the time. We are during the time, and in a moment it will be the end of the time. What will, what will happen with the user? The session will remain uh, opened, or he uh, automatically will be denied? You mean... Uh, I, I mean... For example, now you, it's uh, four eighteen p.m. on your uh, on your watch. Yes. Yes. Okay. Let's put now. It will end at uh, four nineteen p.m. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's a time user login. Yes. Uh, during the login, mm -hmm. we'll stay like one minute, and after that, will be on the time when uh, the policy will expire. Okay. The rule. Okay. What will happen if uh, the user yeah. will try to do something? No. So when he's already <laughs> authorized. But the time for using, uh, it's expiring. No. So the way it works is, right, so ultimately, what is the, the, the time is governed by the policy. Okay. Right? Yep. And it is evaluated at the point you authenticate. Right? Yes. So let's say you have it set to 4. Right? So user comes at 3.15. Okay. And now you authenticate at 3, uh, 3.59. You authenticate at 3.59. OK. Then you can log in. You are logged in. Yes. Okay. And you can use some services. 
when you are logged in? No, once you log in, you pass a re response to the service provider. Okay. Right? So now the service provider side can decide what to do. So what this policy says is, during this time period, we will not issue any tokens. But the token will expire for a period of time. No, no, no. no. Token will not expire. So token has its own expiration time. So if token expiration time is after five minutes, right, okay. it will be there. Okay. So it's up to the service provider to decide what to do. So we will pass a SAML, if, if user authentication is at 359, okay. we will pass a SAML token with five minutes to the service provider. Okay. Right? So now if that SAML token is fine, you can do whatever you want. Right? I see. So the policy gets evaluated only at the point you authenticate. So, so it doesn't matter if the time it's running no. out and you can, uh, yeah, another token will not be generated. No, no. Okay. It's up to the service provider to generate it. Right? Okay. So that is... That is not just this one, right? It's, it's a common problem that you have when you have an IDP and dependent set of applications, right? Say, for example, you log in, forget about this time-based thing, right? You log into a service provider through IDP, right? Okay. Now you log, so then the service, IDP issued a token to service provider, now you are happily working on the service provider, right? So somehow your account get compromised, so somehow you get notified, you log the account at the IDP side. Yes. But still, you can, the user can work at the service provider side. So that is because there's a gap, there's an issue where you cannot communicate the events from the IDP to the upstream applications. Right? To fix that issue, there's a specification coming up under the uh, OAuth Foundation, right? okay. uh, under OpenID Foundation. It defines a way, a standard event format, and standard way of communicating these upstream events to the other applications. So if your account get locked, define set of events. You get yes. account get locked, account get compromised, password expired. So then you communicate those events to the upstream yeah. applications. Based on that, they can make the decide decision. I think even you can have like connection lost or something. Sorry. You can have also connection lost something. The it, Wi-Fi. At that point. Yes, yeah, the Wi-Fi can can be a problem on the network. And but like at this, which point when you send the events? After you send the event, for example, you can have something. Yeah, so saying. that's a different layer to fix that. Yeah. So, yes, so the connections are not reliable. Yes. Right? So then you need to worry about a reliable way of doing that. So rather, rather than when you, trans, when you send the event to the uh, service provider, then you need to use a reliable communication channel. Like it can be a, a PubSub model. Yeah. Right? You pub, publish the message, so they will pull the message when the service is up. Like that. Yeah. Right? Okay. Thank you. You have a question? Uh, okay. Does it provide some way to do self-service and all the workflow related to the provisioning, like email confirmation, CAPTCHA, and other yeah. things? Yes. Yeah. So we do, yeah. So we support uh, those features too. Like you can configure uh, after how many number of failed attempts you need to display the CAPTCHA. You can also configure after how many number of failed attempts you need to lock the account. You can lock the account permanently, also you can decide, lock the account, but unlock it after a number of minutes. So we do have those features too. Okay. You, you have a question, yeah. Hi, going back to the, um, the question of a second ago. Yeah. Um, generally, I don't know if you, I missed this earlier, or if you're coming up to it, if you're coming up to it, then that's fine. But to what extent does WSO2 as an IDP, to whatever extent it, delegates being an IDP to Facebook or whoever, to what extent does it manage sessions? So we say single sign-on. I don't know if you mean that as in um, WSO2 manages all of the signing on, or once I've signed on here, I'm also signed on to other things, and WSO2 will manage the time that I am signed on for. So I log into Salesforce, and if I close the browser and come back to Salesforce, WSO2, well, not even close the browser perhaps, but if I go to another application also with I, WSO2 as the IDP, it will recognize me mm -hmm. as the same user and I won't have to enter my red, um, okay. details. Okay, yeah, so let me explain like how the session management works, right? So whenever, so all the downstream applications, in this case Salesforce, they trust the identity server, right? So whenever you log into identity server, identity server creates a session for that particular user. Right? So let's say you can log in in multiple ways. 
you can log in with username and password, you can log in with multi-fact authentication, you can log in with Facebook, right? We don't worry about any of this stuff. However you log in, you will ultimately create a login session in IDP, right? So whenever you come to identity server, you redirect to Facebook. If you already had a session at Facebook, that's fine. Then Facebook will avoid a relogging. It will send a response back to identity server. If it is valid, we will create a session for that particular user in IES and send the response back. And session management at the service provider side, it's up to the service provider, right? So when you first come to the service provider, it should first check whether it has a session with, with its own session. If that session is not there, then you need to redirect to the identity server. Each time when user comes to the service provider, you don't need to redirect to IDP. You need to manage your own session with your cookies at your end. Sure. So I understand right? the um, session being managed by the application. Each application, once it's had an authentication, it will manage the session from that point yes. onwards. But my question is more about having two separate distinct services, which both have WSO2 as their IDP. Then it's single sign-on, yes. So I go to the second provider, and WSA2 doesn't prompt me for my username and password again. No, no. So let me show you that, right? So that, that's the whole, like, the single sign-on. Yeah. Yeah. Like, so now I can log into Salesforce, right? So if you go to list here, Salesforce, and let me remove this stuff, OK? And copy this. Now create a private browser. So this will ask me to log in because this is a private session, right? Private browser, no cookies. Now I also have a Google Apps account, right? This is also relying on identity server, another application. This is a second application you talked about, right? So now if you go here, Google Apps, it should automatically log me in. I'm logged in. Right? So it's sent to the identity server. Identity server didn't authenticate. You log in. But then again, in identity server, by service provider, you can, you can configure how you want to authenticate the user. Let's say you, 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 you have just the username and password to Salesforce. But Google Labs has username and password plus FIDO, a multi-factor authentication. Right? Then if you first authenticate Google Labs, Sorry, first of all, Salesforce, then you have done with the first step already. Then if you try to log into Google Labs, we will not do the first step. We'll just do the second step and send the response back to Google Labs. Right? Any other questions? Yeah. Okay. Where you go to Salesforce, but not to Google, or to Google, but not to Salesforce. Okay, okay, yeah. So basically, if, you, if identity server has already issued a token to Salesforce, should not issue a token to Google Labs, right? Yeah, so we don't, we cannot do that with the default set of policies, right? But you can extend the policy module there and write that logic. That has to be written. That has to be written, yes. Right, yeah. Uh, in, the, in your example, you use the default PDP. Right. The, the default, uh, uh, the default. Uh, That's PDP. right. PDP, the embedded PDP, which okay. is running in the identity server itself. Uh, yeah. Is there, uh, there is a way to configure this or to change uh, external PDPs? Uh, no, the default one. Uh, you do it from the console or uh, from uh, the files uh, of. Uh, yeah. So default PDPs they are already, right? So when you uh, there's no additional configuration you need to do. Right, when you have the policies here and when you dispatch the policies, and if you just pick the PDP subscriber, the policies will get deployed to the default PDP. If you want to have multiple PDPs, then you need to add those PDPs, put the URL and give the credentials, then you can pick to which PDPs you need to deploy this policy. Right? Any other questions? By default, it's also not enabled. Default one is enabled already. Enabled. You need to deploy the policies. The PDP is running. You need to deploy the policies. Any other questions? Okay. So now it's good. Like you start to ask questions. Right? Uh, 
So now let's see uh, how to enable multi-factor authentication, right? So we have multiple options. We support uh, FIDO, so FIDO U2F. So FIDO is becoming the de facto standard for multi-factor authentication. And we support OTP or email and SMS. We do support TOTP, right? Like if you have the Google uh, Authenticator app, you can use that with identity server. Then if you want to use like mobile-based authentication, we support MePIN, Duo Security, RSS ID. Likewise, we support like 30 plus connectors. Right? So I didn't say out of the box, it ships a set of connectors, but if you want to download more, you can go to store.wsu.com and under IS connectors, you can find the available connectors. Right? So I'll show you how to, how to secure uh, the connection to uh, AWS with uh, multi-factor authentication. Right? So I need to go to uh, the particular service provider. Let's go to AWS, right? And the local and outbound authentication configuration. Now I need to define two steps, right? I need to go to advanced configuration. The first step is already there. That is basic code, right? I need to pick user attributes and subject identifier from that step. And I'll add another step, authentication step. There I need to pick FIDO, that's all, right? And for the admin user, I have FIDO device registered, right? Yeah. Okay. So let's go and see, uh, this user has attributes to log into AWS. Okay, this use is fine. So now, let's pick that particular URL. And FIDO at the moment, it only works with the Chrome. Uh, Firefox, I think recently they had uh, uh, the latest build of Firefox supports FIDO, right? So the browser should support that too. Now if you go to so this is the, the FIDO keys. So this is YubiKey, right? So I have registered one of these against the admin account. Now if I copy this one and go to this will take me to identity server. Then I log in with admin admin. And this will prompt me to enter with YubiKey. So I need to plug this one to my USB, and then I need to tap it. Okay. So what is the reason this here? So this means this user doesn't have, I use the admin user here, right? This user doesn't have the valid credentials to log into uh, AWS. The, the role attributes are not correct. So let me do that with Salesforce. Right? So it should be FIDO. And okay, basic FIDO. I think admin user is provision to uh, Salesforce, so it should work. So now you can see I'm logged in Salesforce, right? So you can pick uh, and configure any uh, authenticator you want in multi steps. Yeah. Under your profile, you can remove it and add the new one. Yes. Right. So if you go to uh, 9446 says dashboard, that's the self service portal where you can uh, update your profile, register authenticators, like that. 
Any other questions? You can you can configure right. We can configure the portal only username password, right? Either you can enable Fido to that too. Then you need to go to the administrator to do the recovery. Right. Or else you can register multiple multiple devices too, multiple uh, Fido devices. So if you lose, you can register, go log in with what you have and remove the other one. Yeah, yes, so you need, yeah, so there we use Twilio as a service, right? So here you need to configure Twilio. I, I can show it, but it won't work with my one. If you have a number, I think we can, I can try it out. Uh, so here you need to configure the Twilio, uh, Twilio configuration. So then you just need to pick it as a second factor, then you will send the, the, the SMS, the code over SMS. Yeah. You can have the second step, multi multiple choice. So you can have a basic one. Mm -hmm. And after that, you can choose the second step. What you prefer? You have an SMS, you have a file, do you have. A yeah, you can do that. Yeah, let me, let me show it, right? So if you go back to uh, 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 Salesforce here, right? So I'll pick, uh, go here, advanced configuration. First step, I'll put. Uh, this one and uh, this one only. Then second step, I'll put, uh, I'll remove this. I'll put Facebook and Yahoo and uh, another IES instance there, right? Okay, so now The first step is username and password. Right? The second step, you get all the options. You can pick how you want to log in. Right? I'll pick Facebook. Take the Facebook and I'll log in. Right? So there's a multi option. Yeah. In the uh, multiple steps, uh, how do you deal with the, with the claims from the different uh, uh, okay. identity providers? For example, if you have a local store in the first step, and mm -hmm. the second step, you have uh, Google or Facebook. Uh, how do you deal with the, the different claims? That yeah, you yeah. So if you take Facebook, right? So when you when you go to second step, when you click on the particular IDP, we know who the IDP is, right? So you can get like different attribute IDs in the response. Now in the in the configuration of the IDP claim mapping, so if you go to uh, Facebook here, right? Now if you look at the authenticator. Uh, Facebook configuration. So we are we request these fields. We need the email, first name, and last name, right? So this is how the Facebook will send these attributes to identity server. But but looking at these attributes, it's meaningless for us. Like if you want to provision just in time provision this user identity server, we need to find a way to map these attributes to the attribute IDs in the LDAP, right? So now in the claim configuration you define, what does this mean? You say email from Facebook is this is. I didn't service this claim you are right. First name from Facebook is this in IES. Right? So this way we can identify the real meaning of these claims. Right? But uh, okay, you have this from uh, Facebook. Mm -hmm. Okay. Second, uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. IDP that, uh, you used. Okay. How okay. Then, which which email to send? Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, in the service provider, mm -hmm. uh, the response uh, that you. Okay. The that you yes. Send. That is you configure here, in here advanced configuration. So in a given step, you always pick one, right? So in each step, you can pick which step I need to pick the attributes. So here I pick the attributes from the local LDAP. If you want to just send the attributes on a Facebook or the LDAP, external IDP, you need to check here. 
Then pick the user's attributes from the second step. Right? But you cannot both. Take from both steps. Only from, from one step. Yeah, you are saying, okay, pick, pick uh, first name and last name from the Facebook and pick the email from this one. Yes, so we cannot do that out of the box. Yes. Yeah. You need to pick, pick one place where to send the attributes. Yes. Right? Okay. So, uh, and then again, we can also just in time provision the user. Right? So, when you log in with Facebook, let's go back to uh, this one and just enable Facebook. Right? Now you get the user attributes from Facebook, and I can create an account in Admin Server itself during the login flow. Right? To do that, you need to go to uh, the uh, service uh, IDP here, edit it, and uh, just in time provisioning, you need to enable it and pick to which user store I need to provision this particular user. Right? So if you look at the users, this user is already provisioned. Like since that was enabled, if you go to users here, and under foo, this user is provisioned from Facebook, right? So if I'll try it again, just delete that user. There's no user called Prabhat there, right? So if you go to Salesforce, right? So it got, got related to Facebook. So now I'm logged into Salesforce with my Facebook, and this is not what we want to see. What we want to see whether this user got provisioned. If you go here, user stores, sorry, uh, users list, users, you should this particular user is provisioned. And if you look at the user profile, you will see the attributes are fetched from Facebook, right? You create a you account for this particular user. And we have another cloud demo plan uh, before handing over to Dimutu. One last thing. So let's say when you log into Salesforce, right, you need to specify certain attributes that are mandatory. Right? This can be any of your applications. Let's say uh, if you want to log into your, this particular web app, the user must bring a value to the country attribute. Right? Otherwise, useless. To do that, so I'll just put the, this one here. You need to configure claims, so I'm sending country and uh, given name, but I can mark country as mandatory. Right? That means if user doesn't have value to country, no point of sending response to the service provider. Right? Done, let's go and see whether Peter has a country. Okay, Peter has a country, I'll remove it. Okay, so now let's see what will happen. Okay, now if I try to log into Peter, it prompts me to enter the missing values. Right? So country is a mandatory attribute to Salesforce. User doesn't have value, so I can enter. Let's put USA. And submit. So along with that, it will submit the response to uh, the service provider. Now if you look at the p-test profile, you should see it's updated, right? So this is a good way, like when you have multiple service providers, they have different uh, attribute requirements, right? Rather than handling that at the, ID, the service provider end, you can delegate that to the IDP, right? So any questions? Uh, yeah, so maybe uh, Dimutu can uh, set it up. So we, we have, we, we launched our uh, uh, public cloud release in last July. So it, it is just the MVP release. It doesn't have all the functionality that you saw in the product. It addresses a basic use case of like, you can have your on-prem user store, and then from cloud to on-prem you can link. Then you can log into SaaS apps through your cloud IDP. So Dimutu will uh, do a demo on that. Yeah. Yeah, Dimutu.
Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. So I'm planning to do the identity cloud demo. So this is what I'm planning to demo. First, uh, I'm going to configure an on-prem LDAP with the identity cloud. And then configure, uh, there are two sample applications that uh, already comes pre-configured and log into those sample applications from a user who's on the local LDAP. Then after that, uh, if provided that we have time, I will show you how to configure uh, Salesforce against identity uh, cloud IDP, right? So this is the setup, uh, this is what this is uh, what we have in identity cloud. So enterprises have LDAP user stores and uh, we require an agent to be deployed on your internal network. So this agent will create a WebSocket request, WebSocket connection with identity cloud. And uh, so the flow goes like this. When a user tries to access an application, it can be a SaaS application or an in-house application, it will generate an authentication request to IDP. Uh, so the, uh, what Prabhat showed, uh, the way you configure a service provider in uh, identity server is all duplicated in identity cloud. So these are end user facing UIs. We have better UX, uh, but it uses the same code, same backend. Uh, so service provider configuration is in the identity cloud. Looking at that, uh, the identity, uh, identity cloud's IDP will uh, send a request to the agent, which will connect to the LDAP uh, and authenticate the user, right? So that's what I'm going to demonstrate. So for the LDAP, I hope you can see, okay, I don't know how to make, uh, I have two users. So think now that I am the IT, uh, IT engineer in, in, an, in the enterprise, I have two users in my company. So one is Smith and one is Smoothly. So it's myfoods.com. Hi, this is my LDAP. I'm using the LDAP browser. And uh, yeah, font size or? Okay, is it okay now? Okay, zoom. Command plus or control plus? Okay. So what's the problem? Is it having? So let me see. Um, yeah, so this is an LDAP. This is an LDAP browser. In my LDAP, I have two users. So one is Smith and one is uh, Mutuli. So uh, let's go to the cloud. So I'm going to, uh, so if you get this is better, right? Now, this is the demo. This is Identity Cloud. I have registered and got myself uh, a tenant in the cloud. So it's a production cloud, and if you register, you will get a 15, day, 15 days free tri trial. So I got an account like that. So my tenant is demo EUCon 17. Now I'm going to start configuring my local LDAP with the cloud. So let me go here and add a directory. Internet is a bit slow. OK. So uh, I'm going to connect uh, my LDAP to cloud. So when I click on connect LDAP to cloud, it will download, a, it will download an agent. Right? 
and give me a key. So now I need to unzip the agent. So I'm gonna okay. Right? So I'm gonna unzip the agent that got downloaded. And I'm going to start the agent. So first, uh, so what I have to do is, now I have to configure the agent to connect to my LDAP. So I go to configurations. There's a file called user store config XML. There I have to tell, um, what is the connection URL of the LDAP? What is the connection name? What is the connection password? In my case, the password is secret. And uh, I have to specify the user search base. Um, and the name attribute is UID. Everything else is the same. So I configured the LDAP to be this. Right? So I save it. Any questions? Everything's clear, right? Okay, so now I'm gonna uh, start the agent. So in order for uh, the agent to connect to the cloud, it needs the token. I'm gonna to the token. So the WebSocket connection is created. So in the demo, now this part is connected. So this is the agent that you deploy on-prem, which connects to the LDAPs user server. Right? So the agent is connected now. Now I can uh, try out connected. Now I can try out sample applications. So the identity cloud uh, has sample applications. So let me see. Go to user portal. Okay, I don't have any applications. Let me see. Um, applications. Okay. I don't have sample applications. Go to OV. Okay, so since I did not try the uh, sample out in this case, I don't have the sample applications. But let me go to another tenant that I already have configured sample applications on. So, um, okay, so what I can do now is uh, configure Salesforce. But I don't have sample applications, that's fine. So I'm going to configure Salesforce, uh, add applications. I'm going to add Salesforce, my Salesforce portal. Right? So I have already configured the uh, uh, Salesforce uh, account.
So in my Salesforce account, I have configured a identity server as an IDP. So what I have done is I have uh, the same thing that Prabhat demonstrated. So basically, I have uploaded the metadata file that I downloaded from Identity Cloud. And I have created uh, the I have created this uh, created identity cloud as Salesforce IDP. Then I have gone to domain and enabled that IDP. Right. So let me um, configure the service provider configurations for Salesforce in Identity Cloud. To do that, to do that, go here and I'm going to get the entity ID. So the same configurations that Prabhat did, it's oh what happened? OK. OK, it's the same configurations that Prabhat did, but in a different UI, right? So uh, the issuer should be this. And the assertion consumer URL should be this. So this is, this is where Identity Cloud is going to send the SAML token to for the SAML token. I'm going to say this is my sales force portal. portal. I'm going to configure this as the access URL. All right? This is for the App Store. So when it comes to when it comes to on-premise uh, version, we do not ship the App Store with the product, but in the cloud version, we have the App Store with the product, with the cloud version. So when you add applications, it will uh, come up in App Store, right? So it, it is easy for uh, users to find all the apps. OK. So now let me go to the user portal it might take a few minutes for this to deploy okay so it it has got deployed now i'm i'm in the administrator um uh, area so i'm i'm accessing it as dimutuela.wsr.com but i really want to access it as a, one of the users in the LDAP in the LDAP. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get an incognito window. So this this is the behavior my users will see, like people in myfoods.com. So if I'm a person in myfoods.com, I might go to the App Store. I will log log in. So I had two users. I'm going to use Mutuli at myfoods.com, login. So you can retheme these pages to say my foods log to have my foods logo. So I'm logged in. Now all of the applications that I configured single sign on will appear here. Right? So if I click on Salesforce, I should be able to log in without entering my credentials. Something went wrong during authentication process. Okay, let me see. Okay, so it got a it needed little time to de deploy. Okay. Anyway. 
<laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, what is your planning for uh, shipping UMA and other new standards like proof of possession tokens okay. in identity server? Yeah, so it's a tricky question because we have the UMA vice president here in the audience. Uh, uh, so yes, so we we, uh, we have done an UMA uh, one o implementation. Uh, so we did that as a as a GSOC project. Uh, so UMA has like uh, multiple ingredients. So it's built under for O2O. You need to support um, O2O introspection, uh, resource registration. There are different profiles, right? So it's a collection of these. Uh, those are the ingredients we need to build to support UMA. So we did that with uh, with UMA 1 no? and UMA 2 was released very recently. So now we are in the process of upgrading that to support UMA 2 So possibly like uh, it's not a very high priority at the moment, right? Uh, I'm sure you don't like that, <laughs> right? Uh, so by the end of like 2018, so possibly we'll have uh, UMA support. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, So we actually only demonstrated a limited set of functionality. Like we have, have complete support for O2O. So if you are using WSO2 API manager, it's the identity server which is running internally uh, to do the key management stuff. All the tokens issued uh, by the identity server and validation all done by the identity server. And also, uh, if you remember the policy that I edited uh, to uh, enable the, the authorization for Salesforce login flow, so that's written in SACML. And you can define any number of policies in identity server. And we have REST API, uh, which when, like, if you have external applications, just to see like who, which users can do what, you can use that REST API to see whether the user is authorized to do the, the actions. Okay. So Prabhat, I have a backup uh, okay. app store. Yeah. So here, everything works. I don't know, maybe. <laughs> so I'll show the backup app store that I configured uh, just yesterday. So there are two sample applications and Salesforce. So if I config, uh, now I'm logged into App Store as Muthali at myfoods.com. If I launch it, I will log into Cafe 11. So you can see I, I have already logged in, right? So I don't, I didn't have to give my password. I, I already got, I got logged in. And the same with. Uh, um, Salesforce, I will initially see the login page, but I will I do, do not have to log in. I'm automatically logged in. Yeah. So this is the MVP release of the Identity Server Cloud. Uh, so this has very limited function. You don't see like multi-factor authentication stuff, the the conditional authentication flows, those stuff you won't see here. Even the, the uh, OAuth security stuff, the, the product supports that internally. But this particular UI we built on top of uh, identity server for cloud, it doesn't have exposed those functionalities. So the plan is to add uh, the make uh, this UI much better and add more functionalities and incrementally add deploy those in the cloud. By, by Q2 next year, we'll have a cloud version which has all the features that is in on-prem version. Any other questions? Uh, Okay, thank you very much, thanks.